let's turn together in God's Word this morning to Romans 14, and we'll be looking at verses 10 through 12. <clears throat> Romans 14, verses 10 through 12. <clears throat> Romans 14, starting in verse 10, where God's Word reads as follows. Why do you pass judgment on your brother? Or you, why do you despise your brother? For we will all stand before the judgment seat of God. For it is written, As I live, says the Lord, every knee shall bow to me, and every tongue shall confess to God. So then each of us will give an account of himself to God. So far, the reading from God's word, may he add its blessing to our hearts. Please be seated. In the Gospel of Luke, the 12th chapter, starting in verse 13, Jesus tells the parable of a rich fool. Now, this man is not a fool because he lacks intelligence. As the parable points out, this man is actually a successful agricultural magnate, as we might call him today. He has, at the very least, business smarts. The parable tells us that he has invested in lands that produce an abundance of crops, so much so that he has filled his existing barns to overflowing. His current warehousing system is inadequate to handle the fruit of his labor. But fortunately for this man, not only has he invested wisely in the lands, he is also an entrepreneur. And so he is casting vision, and he is making plans. And he is multiplying his riches. He is building bigger barns so that he can bask in his fiscal prudence. This man in verse 19 of Luke 12, he, he's talking to himself. He's talking to his own soul. And he says, soul, you have ample goods laid up for many years. Relax, eat, drink, be merry. His plan has worked. His discipline has paid off. His business has made him a rich man. And God calls him a fool. Why? Because he has spent his life securing something for himself in this world. In this case, material riches. But it says at the end of this parable, in verse 21, that he is not rich toward God. Romans 14, verses 10 through 12, is urging you to be rich toward God. And it's doing so with a specific motivation in mind. Romans 14, verses 10 through 12, is saying to you, be rich towards God, because every person will stand before God to give an account of himself. And we're going to see that lesson by looking at this text in two parts. First, we're going to look in verse 10 at the pride of judging your brother. And then we're going to look next at the humiliation of standing before God in verses 11 and 12. So the pride of judging your brother in verse 10, the humiliation of standing before God in verses 11 and 12. So let's begin by thinking about the pride <clears throat> of judging your brother. Again, from Romans 14 verse 1 to chapter 15 and verse 13, we are going to be in a, in a section of scripture that deals with how Christians should defer to one another. Now that's telling, isn't it? This section of Scripture is far larger than the, what the Bible says about the millennial reign of Christ. And yet we give less attention to something like this. We give less attention to this, this, this teaching from God's Word about how the Christian living side by side must learn to defer one to another. Now, a general outline of 14 verse 1 to 15 verse 13 will help us and keep us 
from making mistakes about the details as we see the overall picture that Paul is going to set before us. So remember verses 1 through 9, we saw how the stronger and the weaker brother are to act charitably towards each other. They're not to despise each other. They're not to pass judgment on opinions or disputable matters. Today's text is really directing the Christian to self-examination before the Lord. Verses 13 through 23 tells us that we're not to judge, we're not to despise, because we are to build up our brother and sister, not tear them down. And in verse 1 to 13 of chapter 15, we see that self-forgetfulness and deference within the Christian church is this Christ-likeness that we've been talking about since chapter 12 and, and verse 1. And so this big picture outline keeps us, protects us from an error in each section that we will come across. Now, the first thing that we want to establish is what is the error that we're guarding against right now, today. The error that we're guarding against as we move into verses 10 through 12 is that we should not think that these sections give us any room for the conclusion that because we are not to pass judgment and because we are not to despise, therefore, all things are open. It's all fair game. And that means that I can finally do the things that I always wanted to do because none of y'all are allowed to judge me or despise me. This section is not saying you are now free to live in a worldly way. The correction, as we can see from the outline, just a broad strokes picture, the correction against judging isn't to allow you to indulge yourself, but it is to increase within you your personal holiness. It is not for you to, to leave behind good opinions. It is for you to solidify in your opinions that you are walking in holiness before God. And so verse 10 is picking up for where verse 9 left off. We are not to pass judgment and we are not to despise our brother. And in verse 10, we're, we're, we're seeing that that conversation continue. There, there, is, uh, there are two questions in verse 10. The first question asks, why do you pass judgment on your brother? Now, passing judgment on your brother is the sin of the weak Christian. That's what Paul says. Passing judgment is the sin of the weak Christian because in verse 2 of chapter 14... We, uh, we understand that the weak person does not eat meat. So the weak person abstains. And then in verse 3, we, say, we see that the one who abstains is told not to pass judgment. So the passing of judgment is the sin of the weak brother. The weak brother has an opinion. It's, a, it's not a clear statement of doctrine. It's not a clear commandment from God's word. Those are not opinions. Those are the truth. But this weak brother has an opinion. And he sees a brother or sister not living according to the conclusion that he has drawn. And he passes judgment. He says, I can't believe that they are doing that. Are they even following the Lord? That's one question that is asked in verse 10. There's a second question in verse 10. Why do you despise your brother? Despising is the sin of the strong Christian. God has given to him an understanding of what is obligated and what is optional. He has an understanding of the freedom that he has in Christ. 
specifically in this text with regard to the ceremonial laws of the Old Testament. And he looks down on his brother because the brother is not walking in the same way. And both of these questions come to the same point in verse 10. And what is the point that, makes, that, that, that is made in verse 10? The point comes in response where, where Romans says, we will all stand before the judgment seat of God. So you ought not to pass judgment and you ought not to despise your brother because you also will stand before the judgment seat of God. That means that you should not be preoccupied with your brother or sister's mistakes as you perceive them, but you should be preoccupied with your mistakes, with your sins before the God of heaven. Don't be preoccupied with your brother's errors because you have plenty to answer for yourself when you stand in the presence of God. So Romans is really dealing with what Jesus says in another place where, he, where Jesus teaches us, get the log out of your own eye before you go after the speck in your brother's eye. See, the opinions that Romans 14 verse 1 is talking about are never, never the most important parts of the Christian life and doctrine. And yet the opinions of verse 1 are often the most contentious issues in the church. Why is that? Because the church is populated with people. And like all people, the Christian is easily tempted with pride. Among Christians, it is easy to come into another gathering of Christians or to come into the gathering of Christians which you usually attend and to look around and ask, is everybody doing it the way that I think it should be done? And I guarantee you, in no body of believers is everybody satisfied on that point. People will look around and say they are not doing it in the area of opinions according to my preference, according to my conclusion. And the result of that question often is that pride takes over. But then there is also an opposite sinful response, which is rooted in pride as well. And that's when people hear the exhortation from Paul that you're not to judge and you're not to despise. And the conclusion then becomes that I can do whatever I want. The response cannot be to what Paul is saying. Finally, finally I am free to do whatever I want to do what everybody else is doing. It cannot be the right response. Verse 10 keeps you from, com from concluding that, that finally you're free to pursue your own life because it tells you that you will stand before the judgment seat of God. If you came away from last week's sermon saying, now the doors are open to worldliness. You have drawn the wrong conclusion. Romans never, in any section of Romans, can you find any room for the Christian to have love for the world. Romans isn't dealing with whether or not you can do X, Y, Z because your neighbor can't judge you now. Romans is saying to us, get your eyes off other people and begin examining yourself. That's why I say it's more along the lines of getting the beam, uh, the beam out of your own eye and, and the speck out of your, your neighbor's eye. See, Romans is saying you should be more preoccupied 
with making sure that your opinions are presentable to God rather than whether another Christian's opinion is presentable to you. That's the point of what Romans is saying. It's saying get your eyes off other people and recognize that you will be scrutinized yourself by God Almighty. And isn't that where the the light of the Christian should be? In, in, In living faithfully in the presence of God Almighty? Isn't Isn't it true that the Christian should be preoccupied with the delight of the Lord? The opposite sin that I've been talking about is the result of people too often responding to the subjective side of Christianity, which says don't judge, don't despise in cases of opinions. People look at that and they interpret it along the lines of license. They hear the Bible say, don't judge and don't despise. And the conclusion is, well, I can do whatever I want. And and Romans is not directing us in that direction at all. Romans is directing us not to meddle in other person's applications and opinions for the most part because you have enough to deal with in your own life. You will stand before the judgment seat of God. When's the last time you have seriously asked yourself that question? What will I say when I'm in the presence of God? Not about my neighbor. What will I say about me in the presence of God? See, I think as Christians, we rarely ask that question of ourselves. I think we often ask it about other people. We rarely ask it about ourselves. And the devil likes nothing more than when you are distracted with self-satisfaction. When you say to yourself, it is not necessary for me to ask that question because I'm doing just fine, thank you very much. I know a few people who should be asking that question, and maybe I'll point it out to them, but I'm doing just fine fine. Sometimes the devil uses the opinions among Christians to that very thing. We hold an opinion and we look at a person who's not following our opinion. And instead of asking, what should I be doing? We begin saying things like this. I can't believe they're not doing this. I would never be stuck doing what those people are doing. And that is pride. That is approving yourself. That is, according to the parable of Luke 12, building a bigger barn for yourself. Because it is not a life that is rich in God. Now, contrasting the pride of judging your brother, we find in our text the humiliation of standing before God. Our text is injecting a sense of urgency regarding evaluating your own life before you deal with the opinions in someone else's. It does that in verse 10 by introducing this notion of the judgment seat of God. And in verse 12, it talks to us about how each of us will give an account to God. Now, in today's political climate, so many questions asked of politicians are answered by pointing their finger to their opponent. But that will not be an option when you stand before the judgment seat of God. You will not be allowed to say anything about anyone who lives around you. The question will be, How have you served the Lord? In this life, we may become convinced that we are exalted above another person. But that's to live with a wrong sense of reference. This life is not lived primarily 
in reference to others. It's lived in reference to God. And when you stand before the Lord of glory, all the self-congratulations that the devil has tempted you with will be thrown out the window. Because you will be on your knees before God Almighty. I know that because it says so here in verse 11. It says that every knee shall bow to me. There will not be one knee that is not bowed before God. Every knee will bow before him. There is no despising the living God. There is no flippancy before the living God. There is only humility and humiliation. Every man, every woman, every boy, every girl will be in the same place. Every single one of us will humble ourselves before the God of heaven and declare and confess to God our obligation to him. We will be all in the same place. In that moment, you will have no thought that will say positively, I got away with that one because no one gets to judge me and no one gets to despise me. There will be no sense of self-congratulation because your opinion was better than another Christian's opinion. You will give an account to God for yourself and God even knows the motive of your heart. Are you under the impression this morning that giving an account of yourself before the Lord is a small matter? The humbling of man before the Lord removes any reading that makes you flippant about your opinion that makes you say, well, I'll just do whatever I want because no one's allowed to judge me and no one's allowed to despise me in this area of, of opinions. No, the book of Romans, by setting the judgment of God front and center, removes the me from my decisions. See, the Christian response of verses 1 through 9 cannot be, you don't get to judge me about my opinions. Because the question is not about what I would like to do or what you would like to do or what my neighbor has done. That is to think about the wrong things. The, the right thing to think about is what ways am I lacking in delighting in the God of heaven? What is a delight in the Lord's eyes? And so when you respond to this question of opinions, with that, the judgment of God in mind, it becomes less about what your neighbor is doing to serve the Lord and more about you preparing to give an account of yourself before the God of heaven. It's, it's not so much about physical barns, is it? It's about how am I rich in God? And that question has to be asked differently depending on where you are spiritually. There is an accounting before God that the unbeliever will give. If you've never thought much about your standing before the Lord, you're right where the devil loves you to be. He is, he is as happy with the man who is so far removed from the Lord that he's, he's ignorant of basic theological truths of, of sin and salvation. The devil is just as happy with me, that man as he, with, as he is with the one who, who's always at church, but only because he has some vague notion of, of tradition and, and habit and, and social obligation. The devil is equally pleased with those because neither are thinking, I will stand before the judgment seat of God. Am I rich in God? Both the person who knows nothing of Christ and the person who knows lots of Christ but cares nothing about him, 
They're, they're in the same condition as the man who builds the barn. They think their life won't be asked of them. They're, they're saying to their souls, it, this is going to be a good life. It's going to be good. I've, I've done my good things. It's going to be good. He never thinks that his life is going to be demanded of him. And God calls him a fool. Biblically, it's foolish to think only of this life and not to be preoccupied with the things of the Lord because there is an eternity. And you will be in it. You will spend that eternity either living in hell or in heaven. If you are outside of Christ, the only option for you is hell right now. Revelation 14, verse 11, describes it as this. Place where the smoke of their torments goes up forever and ever, eternal. They have no rest day or night. You will come into the courtroom of the infinite, almighty, all-knowing God. And what will your account of yourself be? when you stand before his judgment seat? What will you do with the guilt of your sin? Will you present your own pitiful works as satisfying the perfect righteousness that God demands? Or will you come in the perfect righteousness of the Lord Jesus Christ? Well, you must come in the perfect righteousness of the Lord Jesus Christ or you will come in complete folly. You must know your sin. You must own every single one of your sins. You must say, I am guilty before you, O God. You must know the need for the purity that can come only by Christ's works, His obedience, His righteousness being put on you. And you must say to yourself, no more. No more of these earthly barns. No more of storing up my treasure here in, on the earth. I must be rich with God through the precious work of His Son. And I must serve Him with my life. There's also the accounting that a worldly Christian will give to the Lord. Somebody who knows a lot about God, who professes faith in God, but who lives in a way that is contradictory to his profession. Maybe some of you are here today. You profess to be a Christian, but your life would betray it. The devil would love nothing more than for you to spend your days on earth despising your brother, the people in the church, your brothers and sisters, passing judgment on them, even though they are precious in God's sight. He would love for you to make light of the blood of Christ by living in the very ways that nailed Christ to the cross in the first place. But are you ready to give an accounting to God for the stewardship of the time that God has given you? Can you even hear yourself in the presence of God explaining to him why you preferred the pleasures of this world over the holiness that he has secured for you in Christ? Can, can you imagine standing before God Almighty and explaining why you preferred the indulgences of, of the flesh over the worship of the one true God? Can you imagine yourself explaining to God that everybody else was doing it? Can, can you imagine explaining that to God that this issue isn't important because it's just a matter of opinions and you're not to be judged on your opinions? No, you're not to judge another person on your opinions, but judge, God will judge them all. God is the one who will judge these things. 
And if you are a Christian who has surrendered to lawlessness, to sinfulness, to the flesh, to the world, this text is directing you to something far more significant than the things that you think you're satisfying by indulging yourself. As you give an account to God, you will always be ashamed of the sin that has entangled you. You will always wish you had left it behind. And then there's the accounting of the true Christian, the Christian who is walking with the Lord and walking with Christ. If you are in Christ today, there's nothing more foreign to you than to imagine yourself coming into the presence of God with your bag full of righteousness and say, see, look what I did. A true Christian never thinks that way. You will come aware that you are clothed in the righteousness of Christ and you will come without a single stitch of personal pride in that garment. You will come acknowledging that you always could have done more and better. And you will come devastated by your sin. You will say to your father, have mercy on me, a sinner. I don't deserve to be called your child. You will break forth in songs of praise and gratitude when he responds to you in mercy according to his promises. You will thank him for the grace that has upheld you throughout your life. And you will acknowledge that all glory and praise belongs to him alone. But that will not happen if you linger in your spiritual hammock all the days that you have been given. We must be awakened from our spiritual slumber. We must cast off the works of darkness because in Christ we have only the light. And we must stop being preoccupied with inconsistencies and weaknesses in our brothers and sisters and be preoccupied with the fact that I will stand before the judgment seat of God. It doesn't mean that you never get to encourage and exhort your brother or sister. But it does mean that you should live preoccupied with your own failures before God rather than the failures of the people who are around you. Do you think that the texts which call you to be gracious to your weak brother set you free to pursue the world? No, says Romans. It urges you. It urges every single one of us here today with the startling and shocking truth that we will all stand before the judgment seat of God and we will all give an account, not for what our neighbor has done, but we will give an account for what we have done. Let's pray together.